podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. On behalf of International Bipolar Foundation, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Andrew Nirenberg. Dr. Nirenberg is Professor of Psychiatry, Harvard Medical School, Director of the Bipolar Research Program, and Associate Director of the Depression Clinic and Research Program, Massachusetts General Hospital. His primary interests are treatment-resistant depression, bipolar depression, and the longitudinal course of mood disorders. Today, he will discuss the new paradigm of collaboration and why it is important for people with bipolar disorder to seek opportunities to actively collaborate with researchers and why it is important for researchers to actively collaborate with patients. The Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute has sparked a new way of thinking about clinical research, especially around how patients and researchers interact. Specifically, they encourage their patients and researchers to collaborate as equal partners to answer questions important to patients and their families. Patients who agree to enter clinical studies are not subjects or participants, but true collaborators during all stages of research. Dr. Nirenberg is the director of the NIMH Bipolar Trials Network, who recently completed the Bipolar Choice Study that compared lithium and quetiapine. Additionally, the Bipolar Trials Network is in the final stages of completing litmus and effectiveness trial of low-dose lithium alone or in combination with optimized treatment. Welcome, Dr. Nambert. Well, thank you very much, Debbie, and, and thanks for all of you who are uh, on this uh, webinar. I'm actually doing the webinar from a PCORI meeting in Washington. PCORI is the patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and I'll tell you more about the Research Institute in a moment, but the rationale for talking about collaborating together through research to improve clinical care is that the, the researchers, clinicians, and patients all have a common goal, and that's really to have better outcomes for mood disorders, for people with mood disorders. And this, uh, this initiative, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Network, or PCORNET, is an extraordinarily important, very ambitious project to try to change the way that we think about research and change the way that we all do research together. And when I say all, I mean the researchers, the patients, collaborators, and also the clinicians. And ultimately, it's to get the best data that we can so that people can have the best outcomes both in the short run and in the long run. So let's see if I can change the, uh, there we go. So the, the first thing is this is uh, done through the International Bipolar Foundation, as many of you know. Uh, and uh, it's extraordinarily important that I think we support this, this really important organization. Uh, so that, that's, my, that's my only pitch today of, of trying to uh, be thoughtful about that. But first, a story from Susan Edgman Levitan about diabetes. Now, Susan Edgman Levitan is an expert in patient engagement at Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, she has a degree as a physician's assistant. She's a, she's a herself um, a patient who has uh, rheumatoid arthritis and, and for uh, decades has been at the forefront of, of patient engagement. Uh, she's also involved with the, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute Mood Patient-Powered Research Network at the PPRN, and I'll tell you about that later. And she has uh, really taught me uh, a lot and uh, has really been very important in seeing how things really need to be patient-focused. So here's her story about diabetes. She told me that uh, she's been working with patients with diabetes to try to understand their experience as patients. And their experience as patients was that their doctors would 
tell them that if they didn't follow their diet and if they didn't exercise and if they didn't take their medication regularly, that they would have to go on insulin. And unbeknownst to the well-meaning clinicians, patients experienced this dialogue as a threat. Now, for many of them, they did have to go on to insulin. And contrary to their expectations, they felt better on insulin than they ever felt on anything else. And they turned around and then questioned why, why did the doctors hold that out as a threat, or at least as something that they experienced as a threat. And it would have never occurred to well-meaning doctors that their patients were experiencing their discussions about insulin as a threat. And it's in this spirit of really trying to understand patients' experiences with mood disorders that we're embarking on, on this new initiative that I'll be able to tell you about. Now, there are some fundamental questions that all of us who are patients, and everyone, everyone is a patient for something at some time. And both as patients and as caregivers, there's this fundamental question of how do we know what we know? And I really mean that in the sense of if you have a clinical problem, how does your clinician know what to do? And especially if they're competing often. And it's this question that became the reason to form the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute. So one of the things that that has come out of out of this, this is the other rationale, is that for most of the things that clinicians need to decide, we don't have enough evidence to support practice. There's a very high percentage of decisions that really are not supported by evidence at all. There's a large percentage of U.S. population that has really very poor health status because they have multiple problems that have never been studied before. There are great health disparities because of this. There are questions about the reliability of the system growing, about outcomes that we have, and the current clinical research system that tries to generate data to inform clinical decisions, except it's great, except it's too slow, it costs too much, overall it's unreliable, it doesn't address the questions that are important to patients, and it's unattractive to providers and administrators in the system. In other words, there are a lot of papers and other things that come out, but many times they don't have an effect on clinical practice. So the problem is that clinical progress is too slow for randomized trials that try to see what works, that they take too long to do, a, a mean of over five years, and a mean of over seven years if the study is funded by the federal government. And then it takes even longer to implement the evidence where only 14% of the evidence is actually implemented to improve clinical care, and it can take up to 17 years for that to happen. This lags far behind technological progress. So the, the big problem, which treatment is best for whom, is another fundamental question. So high quality evidence is scarce, but 15% of guideline recommendations are actually supported by high quality evidence. And this is just one particular study that talks about this problem. Uh, one of the authors, Robert Califf, is also central to this, uh, the P4Net, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Network. Uh, this is actually a slide that shows that there's a lot of years that are lost um, to different diseases. And if you look at the United States, uh, we're really not doing that well uh, relative to the other countries. And the whole problem is how can we do better and how can we generate the data to be able to do better? So here's the old way of doing research. Uh, researchers will think 
they'll look at the literature, they'll look at their clinical experience, and researchers will determine what are the important questions. The other things that researchers will do is they will decide what things to measure, what outcomes to measure. Uh, so, for example, researchers might look at changes in depressive symptoms, but not necessarily look at are people able to work and love and have a fulfilling life. Right? They're just looking at a decrease in the depressive the researchers will go out and try to find patients, participants, subjects to agree to come into the study. Uh, and they'll do that either through advertising, through clinicians, through clinics, through flyers, uh, sometimes through organizations like the International Bipolar Foundation. Uh, then they'll agree to participate. They will follow the protocol that the researchers put together. The researchers will then collect the data, they'll analyze the data, they'll publish the data in academic journals, try to talk about some of those things at meetings, and then the uh, so-called end users, the clinicians, may or may not act on those findings. And also, because of the way protocols are done, the results of those studies may not even apply to a lot of people. So, one of the things that before, so, so here's what happens, right? So the, the clinician, the researchers prioritize the questions, they choose the topics, they make the protocol, they uh, contact patients, assess the population, design things, they contract and study procedures, and it gets really complicated, and they do more and more that has to be done, and this is just getting the protocol done of how are you actually going to do the study. Then they start with a final protocol, they do complicated contracting budget, they send it to sites, if it's a multi-site, you have to get approved by the IRB, you have to train the sites to be able to do it, study, distribute study materials, what the regulatory, and then a research site is started. Then once a site is started, then they have to find the patients, then they have to control or conduct a trial that, that has oversight to it, and then there's all sorts of changes that's made, and so forth, and then the trial is finished. My, my point here is that it's a very complicated process, and that the problem with this process is that the patients have nothing to do with developing this process. And, and I'll show you in a minute, that's what we're trying to change. All right, this study is, is done, the data cleaned up, they're locked, analyzed, interpreted. Uh, not really with patients, but that's that now an option, uh, disseminated, and then hopefully that has an impact on improving care. So the new way of doing research, the new thing that we are trying to do in collaboration with the International Bipolar Foundation and with other advocacy groups, the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, and also the National Alliance of Mental Illness, really do the research in close partnership with patients. So the new way of doing research is that the researchers and the patient get together to collaborate to determine the questions, determine the outcomes, and form a learning registry. And I'll talk about a learning healthcare system in a moment, but it's really a registry of people who are are willing to be part of the whole enterprise to try to get answers to important clinical questions. Uh, the, uh, the patients and the researchers collaborate to determine the protocol, collect the data, and because of technical things, the researchers will analyze the data, but in collaboration, the research and the patients will be able to interpret the data together and disseminate the findings, and then the patients, researchers, and the clinicians and collaborate to act on those findings. That leads me to then this large thing about PCORNET. Uh, there's actually a very good article in today's uh, um, Washington paper, the um, Washington Post. If you look at that online, you'll find a, a very nice front page story on it. So the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute was established by Obamacare, by tax on insurance companies, and it's a new institute that's evolving. 
Cornet, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Network, is a network of networks that's the infrastructure to do this type of collaboration across multiple things to try to compare treatments or comparative effectiveness and may in fact include somewhere between 26 and 100 million patients. Its uh, goal is to improve the nation's capacity to look at what treatment is better than what other treatment for particular conditions and for whom, to create a large, highly representative national patient-centered clinical research network, and then to do that research that will actually impact clinical care in a timely way and in a way that is affordable and that can actually have an impact on the care of people. The vision is that the U.S. healthcare system will be a learning healthcare system, and I'll show you a, a graphic about that in a moment, and allow for large-scale research to be conducted with enhanced accuracy and efficiency. Now, one thing I want to say is that you'll hear from me in a moment that part of this whole enterprise is the use of big data, the use of electronic health records. Many of us see physicians or clinicians and the data goes into an electronic health record, and part of the idea is to be able to learn from all of those data that go into there. So the solution to the problem, a learning healthcare system, you have what's called iterative feedback, meaning you learn from asking questions of the data, and then you integrate that back into clinical care. So let's say that we find a signal that one treatment is better than another, and then we inform the clinicians, they start to do that, then we can see if in fact that holds true, or if in fact some patients should get treatment A rather than treatment B. So it's to help the clinicians make better decisions, patients make better decisions, and the administration of healthcare systems also make better policy conditions. So that is all through observation of outcomes through the electronic medical record. So, For example, if people get hospitalized, that's something clearly you can see in an event from the electronic medical records. If you could, for example, ask a question, uh, is lithium better than uh, tyrapine or Seroquel to reduce subsequent hospitalizations for people who get hospitalized for mania? the combination better than either one of those things. That's the type of thing that you can do. And because if you just look at the outcomes themselves and people aren't randomized to one thing or another, you can still learn things, but it is still better scientifically and better information if you actually randomize people, a toss of the coin, uh, for one treatment versus another. So this is what a healthcare, a learning healthcare system should be, according to PCORI. So if you go on the, the right-hand side here, you'll see uh, that you have what's called an internal and external scan, meaning you identify problems and potentially innovative solutions in collaboration. You have patients, you have clinicians, you have researchers. And then you design care and evaluation based on the evidence generated. You implement that. You apply a plan. You pilot. You control the settings. You evaluate how that's going by collecting data. And then you adjust using evidence to influence continual improvement. So in a learning healthcare system, research influences practice, and practice influences research. So as I said earlier, with PCORI, it's the patient who is at the center of everything. It's the center of the mission. It's the center of the vision. And the mission is worth reading. And PCORI helps people make informed healthcare decision and improves healthcare delivery and outcomes by producing and promoting high integrity, evidence based information that comes from research guided by patients, caregivers, and the broader healthcare community, and uh, the vision you can read on the right there. So patients and stakeholders play a critical role 
in all aspects of PCORI's work, right? all aspects of it, so that the advice of PCORI on what PCORI should study, there are also patients actually review proposals and they partner in the research, they help share findings, and also they give feedback to PCORI to how they are doing. If I can make this work. Okay, there we go. So the overall objectives of this very large network is to have a single functional research network where patients, providers, and the health system leaders are all engaged, that the system can support asking these questions, what better and who to get new treatment. Uh, it uses external data and research partners that can participate with that. Uh, the external data and research partners are people who can ask questions of the data that may be relevant for them. Um, also, it's meant to be a national resource that other researchers can use it and that the PCORnet partners can also use the resources created with PCORI's support. This is just the structure of PCORI, but it's made up of two large things in the center. Right, the, the patients and populations of patients, and there's the clinical data research networks, or the CDRNs, and the patient-powered research network. Now, you may ask, why is this relevant for me, and what is it relevant to bipolar disorder? And I'll tell you that in a few minutes if you just, just be patient with me. Uh, there are 29 clinical data research networks and patient-powered research networks that were awarded and it officially started six weeks ago, so this is really brand new, spread throughout the country. There's a large clinical data research network partners, and what they will do is use electronic health record data that's standardized with at least a million patients uh, apiece. They, they, uh, these places are capable of doing clinical trials, and it's really very much of an information technology part where they can use the data to learn things, but also identify particular patients who may be interested in collaborating and finding solutions to the problems that they face. They are these complex networks, either academic medical centers, integrated health systems, low-income clinics, um, and they use all sorts of uh, health information exchanges and so forth. This is just a list of all of these. Um, one at the bottom, what's called the Skills uh, Clinical Data Research Network at Harvard, is one that we're very closely affiliated with. Uh, but as I'll show you in a moment, the patient-powered research network that we have, is, uh, anyone can join it once we're up and running, which we figure will be in, in, in the next uh, four to six months. Um, I'm just going to skip that. These are the other disease cohorts associated uh, with with, um, with some of those. But here is really the heart of, of what I'd like to talk about, and this is a patient-powered research network partner. And this is what uh, what we've been able to do, and I'll show you the context that we've been able to get the contract to be able to do something really unique and to move uh, the the types of research that we can do in collaboration with patients order to change the world for the better. So the goal of these PRNs is to target um, a, a large portion of the population. So one of the things that we are tasked to do is to actually gather together 50,000 people with mood disorder, either depression or bipolar disorder, get patient reported data collected for at least 80% of those 50,000, and we are determining what data to collect and how to collect it uh, in a way that patients find useful. We are doing that in collaboration with patients and the advocacy group. We also have patients involved in the governance of how we run this sort of thing, and we're looking at how we standardize the data. So we have a variety of stakeholders who are involved in all of this. Um, we are developing a strong understanding of how do we work with patients who have the disorders uh, of the depression or bipolar disorder in order that we have what's called co-learning. How can we understand 
their perspective, just like the story I told you about Susan Edgman Levitan and people with diabetes, and so they can understand our perspective of how can we do feasible studies in a timely way. There is a significant range of conditions as diseases, as I'll show you in a moment, variety of populations. 50% of the, the networks are rare diseases that otherwise would be impossible to study. And they're all at different stages of uh, maturity at this point. So here are the nine PPRNs, Patient Powered Research Network. What I highlighted is the one that we have, uh, which is called the Mood Patient Powered Research Network. Out of the entire PCORNET, the only thing that's in psychiatry. So we were particularly pleased uh, that, that they were willing to make an investment in this. And then there are rare uh, conditions also, which we don't have to know. So the Mood Patient Powered Research Network, uh, you have to have a diagnosis of depression or bipolar disorder. We consider people who are, in effect, data donors. The data donors, in a sense, are patient collaborators, citizen scientists who have questions about what is the best treatment, and we do it strongly, uh, the relationship as collaborative. Again, as I said earlier, we're working closely with the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance, National Alliance of Mentally Ill, International Bipolar Foundation, of course, and the Anxiety Depression Association of America. As I said earlier, we have the ambitious goal of collecting 50,000 people, and we'll be doing this over the net in a very short time because we only have 18 months to complete everything. And our strategy is multi-pronged to use both electronic medical records, clinicians, internet, social media, and we'll be working closely with the International Bipolar Foundation for outreach and a dialogue with people so that they can figure out that, that uh, or they can make a decision, do they want to collaborate on this to get to better answers or not? What have we learned so far from this? First of all, it really is a co-learning process. And uh, in working with the patients and the stakeholders on the Mood PPRN, uh, we are sensitive to issues about language, about what message will do, about what the user experience should be in using, uh, uh, for example, a usable website where uh, they can not only, uh, not only give informed consent, but we need to absolutely ensure that there's privacy and data security uh, so people can feel okay about donating their data. You know, in these days of, of uh, NSA and so forth, it's a big concern that people have, and, and we're building as many firewalls as we can. But patients are, are, are the center, and we have learned that we can't just put something out there and expect that people will participate, but the reasons to participate must be compelling, and the reasons to keep participating must be compelling. So we're designing the, uh, the front-facing website, as that they say in that language, uh, to make it so that it's attractive to people. And the challenges is how can patients and clinicians use the data, ask questions of the data for themselves and for other people, uh, what is the best website user experience? And we're even considering uh, uh, at some point in the future of collecting either blood or saliva or something else so we can look at biomarkers and understand more about the biology. We've also had preliminary uh, discussions with NIH of how we can do this. But, but I want to emphasize this is a complete game changer. This is a completely different way of how we go, we're going to go about doing business in order to get the essential information that patients need, that clinicians need, in order to move forward and have better lives. So the overall objective is to have this single large network. Again, I, I won't belabor the point, but the, the takeaway is that, that this is part of an ambitious, radical way to be able to get the critical data that we need in order to improve people's care. So again, it, it's my plug for the International Bipolar Foundation. 
Um, uh, it's really fantastically uh, well run by Muffy Walker and, and her colleagues uh, and reaches out uh, really across the entire earth. Uh, we are focusing our efforts for this particular endeavor uh, for the, the Mood Patient Powered Research Network only in the United States, and, and the only reason for that is, is for the moment it has to do with electronic medical records. But we'll see how we do over time. We're only six weeks into this right now, but I'm tremendously excited about how we can do uh, work together uh, to be able to address the most important things that, that patients face. So um, uh, thank you very much for your attention, uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I'll certainly be willing to answer anything that I can. Um, again, this is a work in progress. Uh, we are working to put together both the websites and other things where patients can find out more about it and sign up, but we don't want to do it prematurely before we have something that, that's worth participating in. Uh, so again, thank you all for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Miriam Berg, for sharing this information, this very important information. I do have a question. Um, will it be possible for a non-U.S. resident to participate or collaborate in any way? I am a Southern Ontario um, resident in Canada. You know, one of the things that, that um, we currently don't have any integration across the border. Uh, and actually, I was just in uh, Montreal and in, in Toronto um, for some meetings up there. Uh, and they're trying to have other networks in Canada uh, that, that I, I think um, would also be things that you could participate in. Um, if you contact, uh, for example, um, uh, there is uh, Trevor Young, who is in Toronto, and uh, there's uh, Lakshmi Yatham, who is out in Vancouver, and uh, they're trying to put together a large network that is similar. We would love to be able to collaborate them with them and also have people join us across the border. Uh, we currently won't really have that capacity um, at the moment, unfortunately. Great, thank you for addressing that. Next question, um, do you have any associations with any of the mitochondrial disease organizations? So, um, the, the, um, in fact, I'm on the board of Mito Action uh, and I'm um, uh, presenting at, at their, um, uh, their, their conference on May 3rd. Uh, there are many of us who are particularly interested in, in mitochondrial uh, dysregulations in bipolar disorder, and there are some very interesting, uh, really rather simple interventions that need to be studied uh, to see if it helps people in the long run that target mitochondria. So yes, we're, we're actually uh, closely aligned with that. In fact, the person who I mentioned, Trevor Young, is one of the leaders in the whole field of brain energy metabolism and mitochondrial dysregulation in bipolar disorder. So yes, thank you very much for that question. Excellent, thank you. Um, let's see, next question. Response to question number one. Oh, um, there is a collaborative research network in Canada which involves community throughout the entire process of the research, um, CrestBD, www.crestbd.ca. They are bipolar specific and the network involves many peer researchers. Yes, CrestBD is actually, uh, is really great. Uh, they focus on um, uh, psychotherapy and that type of interventions, if I understand it correctly. Um, and they do absolutely terrific work. Okay, next question. How can other researchers join up their network with yours? Uh, 
Well, if, if, uh, if other researchers want to, you know, all they need to do is contact me. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm easy to find. I'm A. Nirenberg at mgh.harvard.edu. Uh, and and uh, I've talked to a number of people uh, who also are trying to run networks. Each one of the networks has its own um, strategies. And, and we also may collaborate with the National Network of Depression Centers. We're trying to figure that out also. Right now, we're trying to build this up, build in a way that a network, is, as far as I know, is really not been built before in very close collaboration. CRESPD may be one of the few examples of, of this being done well. Okay, next question. Um, could you possibly repeat your email? It didn't come through. All right. It's, it's um, A. Nirenberg. That's A N I E R E N B E R G at M E H dot Harvard dot EDU. Great. Thank you. Um, if you, we are having a little trouble with uh, the feedback. So if you do need that um, email address, please just email me at dbrown at ibpf.org if you can hear me a little more clearly. Okay, that seems to be the last of our questions. I want to thank you very much for that um, incredible information in terms of um, the way research is headed. And I want to let everyone know again that we do record our webinars and they are archived on our website if there's any information that you missed or to refer back to. Um, thank you again, Dr. Nierberg. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, to present on uh, on the behalf of the I, uh, International Bipolar Foundation. Great, thank you, and we will keep you informed um, of his research and and the opportunities to get involved as they become available. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.